even though I didn't have like a huge audience, I wasn't showing up a ton online and I was still getting people referred to me. I was still getting more clients than I could work with. I probably had like 50 people on my mailing list or something. I don't think you have to be a big celebrity to run a business that works. Having a big audience can be a distraction, actually. What's like the the straightest line to your first few customers? And how can you get there faster than you think? And that let, let your, your customers inform whatever the next step is instead of deferring it to this future where, where you have a million followers. If I already have an audience and I want to start monetizing it by building a community. Sometimes I get people who come to me and they're like, oh, I want to build a community, but I'm not sure what, like, uh, who I'm building a community for. Community builders tend to be very people pleasing. We tend, <laughs> I'm including myself in that. We tend to think like, how can I give away more and more and more? One of the things that annoys me is uh, all these platforms now, they have a way to charge your audience to get additional content from you. Welcome to another season of the Beginner Max Podcast, where we showcase founders and operators of top community memberships so that you can use their tactics to build a community business yourself. Today, I am thrilled to have Tadiana with us. Tadiana is the founder of Business of Community, an online school and community that helps founders create profitable businesses by building online communities, as you guessed it. That's why she is the perfect person to learn from if you want to build your own community business. Ariana, I'm so thrilled to have you. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. I've been looking forward to this interview for a lot of weeks now. <laughs> Me too. All right, Ariana, let, let's start by talking about the early days of your community business. So you started by doing client work and helping people as a consultant and helping them build a community and then transition that practice into a cohort-based course, right? Yeah. Um, well, before I was consulting, I was running an in-person community in New York. And the work that I was doing, it was a community for women in tech. And I was a woman in tech. And the work that I was doing as a head of product at a startup was it surrounded community. It was about building community within large organizations. So I had experience building communities and also building businesses, but not as much in the context of building a community and a business at the same time, building a community as a, a business. So yeah. So after uh, I left that job, I started consulting on a bunch of the different skills that I had built sales validating products so like product management and one of the other things I was consulting on was community and that was always the part that felt the most intuitive to me how to gather people how to bring them together how to design a system around it and then eventually how to build a, a business about a, a business around it so yeah it started with working with clients who were doing that and then after having had having helped a bunch of clients launch their communities or improve their communities there are just a lot of frameworks that were kind of naturally happening through my work with clients and part of building the course was that i didn't i, I felt like i was wasting time repeating the same information within the the conversations that i was having with clients and I started to like build documents that I can send them and like record little videos. So it's like the course kind of started to emerge from that work really naturally. And then I, I took a cohort based course about building cohort based courses. And then through that course, I launched the, the course and that's how it started. I love this. So. This is not something that a lot of consultants do, which is, you know, turn their client practice into 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 a cohort based course where they can share some of the tactics that they're using, like, you know, extract some of the commonalities and then share it. Like that's that's such a great idea. I want to double click on that. Do you remember how many clients you hired when you launched this cohort based course? 
Mm, I don't remember. I, I don't remember exactly how many I had had up until that point, but not probably um, like a dozen or something. Um, yeah. Maybe so a little the more. reason the reason why I'm asking it is because like people are really scared about creating a community, especially with let's say a dozen former and current clients, because they're afraid that it like it's not going to be a community it's going to be just 12 people sitting awkwardly in a maybe a slack channel and it being inactive and people not finding enough value in there to engage so did you did you face those challenges yeah so when i first start one thing to think about if you're going from doing some kind of one on one thing into a more scalable course or community thing is that your customer might be different. So uh, to this day, like our consulting clients are different from the people who take take our course or join our community. And that was the case back then too. So I had had a bunch of clients, but the clients that were paying me a lot of money, they, they wanted... They, they, they wanted the strategy kind of done for them. They wanted more of a shortcut. And the people, the first people who joined like the first beta of our course, they tended to be people who were more DIY and they were exploring an idea of building a community. And they were earlier in the, in the process of what they were doing. That's how it broke down for us. Not necessarily like how it always is going to be. So yeah, like over time, they started to like self-select into the right product for them. And we started to like see what those profiles were of the different people who would buy different things. I do think that's a legit worry to have if you have a bunch of people who you know one-on-one. -on -one. We, we can't assume that what they need is a community there are like signs to look for and like things that you can think about on whether it would be a value add to also connect those people to each other. But it's, it's not a given that, that, that should be a next step. I think, even if your clients have maybe have a ton in common. Hmm. Right. And what were those signs for you that, you know, that made you confident that uh, building a community and connecting these people with each other was the right thing to do? Yeah, well, for me, it was that I was really busy as a consultant. So there, I, I was having more people reach out to me to work with me than I had time to work with and, and build the communities for them. Even though I didn't have like a huge audience, I wasn't showing up a ton online and I was still getting people referred to me. I was still getting more clients than I could work with. And... I was just really interested. I, I felt like not enough people were talking about this idea of putting community really at the core of the business that you're building, not as a nice to have, not as a pandemic thing, not as like a, a temporary like marketing strategy, but really like how do you build a business around that? And not a lot of people were talking about it from that perspective. So, um, and, and the people who were, the, the people who were working with me did have that belief in common. And I, I thought that there was a lot of value that could come to the world in general, if the people who were thinking about it in this way, or at least wanted to explore how to build a business in this way, if they were in the same room together and they could like talk about what that looks like for them and what they're figuring out as they as, as they try to do this with their own business. Hmm. This is interesting. Um, um, what really struck me over there was the fact that people were referring, you know, you were getting clients through referrals and you were getting more clients that you could handle. And that is like the dream of, you know, any consultant out there, you know, having so much inbound interest that you, 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 you know, you do, need to select the people. So tell me, how did this happen? Like even with the forward based course, I remember seeing one of your tweets that the course did 100K in its first year of existence, which is, which is really amazing. 
So you're getting all of this inbound interest for your client work and then for the course, cohort-based course that you started. What what was it that was working really well over here? Because I think we all know that this kind of interest is is very uncommon for a new a new course and a new you know you you weren't like a big celebrity so how did you do this yeah i like talking about this because i don't think you have to be a big celebrity to run a business that works and when i was doing this i was just a consultant so i was like barely showing up online i probably had like 50 people on my mailing list or something so it's, yeah. it was really like that first year was really starting from scratch and yeah, like just starting from, from like a very small list of people. One thing I'll say is like, part of that was just luck. It was a time when a lot of people were interested in the com in community. And it was a time when a lot of people were sitting at home and online businesses were like, they, it was like a boom during that time. It was like 2020, 2021 when I started working on the course and like the, the course I think launched in 20. So part of it was just luck. Like I was just right place at the right time talking about stuff that people were interested in. And there were also a bunch of little things that we set up as a way to kind of set it up for success. One was um, I mentioned I was taking this cohort based course about how to build a cohort based course and through that course, I built like a small network of people who uh, were sending me people who might be interested in what I was doing. I very quickly put together a, a beta, like a, it started as like just a one-off workshop that I was teaching. And then it went into like a full beta that was, I think it was a six week cohort based course that was a big discount and I needed 10 people to join and I filled those spots. I think, I think like when I announced it, it was like two weeks away. So I filled those spots within those two weeks, those 10 spots. And then after, after having done that beta, I had a lot more confidence with the content. So I knew it was going to be good. I knew it was going to help people. And I also had testimonials from the people who went through the beta and the community had already like started with those initial people. And then it was after having this like foundation, knowing the content was going to be good or at least like good enough because I had done it one time, having this like little network of people around me who would like ret retweet my tweet if I talked about it or who would um, look out for people who might want to join and and refer and talk about it. Oh, and then I also have built a relationship with Circle. So Circle, the community platform, the, them as a pl platform, they were also growing really fast and they would sometimes send me customers. I was listed as a Circle expert. So they would send me customers and I would also speak in their customer community. So those people, I, I was those people were getting to know me and what I talked about. So that was like another partnership that got a few people to join the initial beta and then the, the first official cohort. So it was a lot of little things that I think when you put them together, it, they were like strategic to, to have a first like successful year. The thing they all had in common is like they most of the things I did were very like community driven. So it was very like, I made friends with these people who I met at this course. And then those people want us, like they know my content and they know who might be interested in it. And they were willing to send their friends over to, to buy in the beginning when it was like hard to build trust because I hadn't done it before. The I had built a relationship with the circle founders and the circle community. So those people had a reason to trust me and come over to build the course. So when starting from scratch, there's a lot that you can do by just becoming friends with people and just using your, your network to kind of get you started in the beginning and then using each step to, to power up kind of what, whatever the next step is going to be. 
This is such a great insight. And especially how you were doing like so many things with such, uh, you know, such a small network, essentially. Like when you compare it with people who have, I don't know, who are building huge audiences and here you are with a few people, but those few people are, you know, it, it includes somebody who was enabling you to partner with a big VC funded platform like Circle and people who will basically support you and retweet your stuff and you know just very close net network so that is that's really interesting yeah i think a lot of us think that we have to have this like viral instagram post or like a million followers on tiktok or something before a business takes off but I actually think it's really distracting when something like that happens. And when you're building a business, you just need customers. Like you just need a fir- like first few people to give you money for the thing that you're doing. And having a big audience can be a distraction to that, actually. So like what's like the, the straightest line to your first few customers and how can you get there faster than you think? And that let, let your, your customers inform whatever the next step is instead of deferring it to this future where, where you have a million followers or where you have a, a viral video or something like that. Um, tell me more about this, like this finding a straight line to find, uh, your first few customers and how it can be closer than what most people think because i feel like i'm in the place of most people if if you ask me to run a cohort based course like today i will be like okay but uh, i don't know people so first let me post a lot of content and build some thought leadership so that i have like 10,000 linkedin followers an email list of 1,000 people and out of those 1,000 people, when I announce my course, then uh, maybe 100 people will show some interest. And out of those 100 people, maybe 10 will purchase the course. Is that now not how things work in your worldview? Maybe. I mean, th- that sounds like a plan. I, I think it depends. It depends what you're trying to solve for. So if you already have an audience, then what you're trying to solve for is what is the the content, the course, the group coaching program? Like, what is the product that I can build that the people in this audience are going to want to pay for? So that's a different question than if I don't have an audience, uh, but maybe I'm confident in the, the content because I've already worked with people one-on-one. I know that it works. So I'm, I'm trying to solve for a different problem. So the, the gap that I have is how do I get, how do I go from like not having a big audience to people buying what I'm, what I'm selling. And the, the, that's what I did. And that's the, the path that I teach most often, because I think it's easier to get someone to pay you than it is to become a celebrity. So the, in, in that path, what I always recommend is you start by just talking to it. It's it's like a very basic, like starting a business from scratch advice. Like you start by having a very rough idea of what your thing can be or, or like starting with a rough idea of who you're really trying to help, like who your ideal customer is. And then you talk to five of those people and you talk to five of those people very broad strokes, like it's not a sales call, it's just an interview, just to get a sense of it is do is the problem that I'm solving that I assume these people have, am I right about that? Do they really bring that up on their own? Is this really something that they need help with? And that's all that conversation can be. But now you've had five conversations and maybe four of those people might be interested in what you're building. So you have like, four people in your bank of potential customers now. And then you go to the next stage where you're like, okay, I think these four people might be interested in what I'm doing. So maybe they just told you they were interested, but you didn't have anything for them to like actually show what their interest is. But maybe you're like, okay, I have a better idea of what I'm doing. The way they described their problem was really clear. So I know what it is. So how can I launch like a very low stakes beta 
for those people. How you structure your beta depends on, on, again, what you're testing. Are you testing the content? Are you testing whether people are interested in paying for it? And it also depends on like the type of community business you're building. Are you building towards like a group coaching thing? Are you building towards a course? Are you building towards a membership community? So depending on which of those you're doing, who your members are, what their problems are, and like the thing you're trying to solve for, then you like create a very low stakes beta for those people. So it could be hosting like a one-off workshop that is has like some kind of minimum that people are paying for. They have to pay something for it, um, but it's very cheap and seeing how people show up and then testing the content that way. And then from there, then you can like start the whole cycle and you can get testimonials from the people who showed up. Those people are now more invested in what you're doing. Hopefully you help them solve that problem in a small way. And now you can like, build it up one more level. So now like maybe when you promoted those, uh, the, the workshop, instead of just the four people who were interested, you were able to like get it, get eight people to show up. So now you have eight people in your bank of people who can help you with the next phase of what you're doing. And then in the next phase, maybe you host a workshop again and you improve it a little bit and maybe it's 15 people. So now you have 15 people in your bank. And then once you like launch the official thing, you built, it's it's not just about like, I have 15 people on this list. It's like, I know 15 people. These are people who I've built a relationship with. And it becomes a much more honest sales conversation because you're real, you're actually building this with the people. You're not just like pretending to like be going through some kind of process, but what you actually want is to like extract value from them. You're actually building the thing that you're building with the people who are interested in potentially being your customer down the line. And then it's like a snowball. Like it just kind of adds like each phase, you can like take a little bit more risk because you have more and more people in your bank of people who you can count on to refer people to you, join the thing and give you money or whatever it is. Um, so mm-hmm. I don't know how clear that was in the middle, but I, I hope that that's like, that makes sense. It, it was clear, but um, it sounds very, um, I don't know, it sounds almost like unbelievable that, you know, you can do that and um, it's possible <laughs> to do that. Like, <laughs> uh, will you be able to give me an example with one of the clients that you've worked with who has built a successful community without having a previously, you know, a previous like big audience? Sure. So, um. There's this community girls club collective, the the founder, her name is uh, Liz Best, and it's a community for women in social impact. So Liz, similar to me, she was like a one-on-one coach. So she had a little bit of an audience and she had a little bit of a product for them, but she was working one-on-one with people. So they're like, it, it, she could only work with a certain amount of people at a time. So She had her professional network, but not necessarily an audience around what she was building. And she came into the community. She took the course and she turned what she was doing into, instead of like a one-on-one coaching situation, she turned it into a community where people were coming together to get to know each other. And she did it by kind of following very similar playbook. So I think she was, her community was more based in like her city. So she did a few in-person events and they were just like networking events for people to meet each other. And that, because that was going to be core to the thing that she ultimately built, it was like testing one of her community experiences. So she, she did that. And in her case, her community was relevant for her past clients also. So she didn't have to build those, some of those relationships from scratch, but she did have to cultivate those relationships and make sure that her past clients were like, she was recruiting them onto her team to both maybe potentially join the community and, or also like send other people to her. So she, she had this like trial period where she was like hosting in-person events. She hosted, a few online events 
And then she launched the community. And if I remember correctly, she had 17 people join, which like, that's not a huge community, but she priced it in such a way where that was like a, actually a really big success for her. So I think it was like only annual memberships and 17 people joined and it was something like $1,500 for the annual. And it was like a cohort that would come in uh, quarterly. So it, it's kind of like the best of both worlds because she was confident that she had the, the space and time to take care of these 17 people that came in. And like all those people felt kind of a part of getting this off the ground. So they didn't feel like it needed to be completely perfect. They knew that they were joining a new community, but they were so, they were well targeted. So they, she knew that they would get along and she didn't over promise what was going to be in the membership. So it was like very clear what they were getting. And that was like over a year ago and the community has, they've done they do new cohorts every quarter ish and the community has grown from there and each quarter they're adding more and more members. So that's an example for, for one that started from scratch into in as a, as a membership. I like this example a lot. So what I'm taking away is that you don't need an audience to build a sustainable community business, but you do need a professional network. Am I right? Ma it makes it a lot easier. Like you, sometimes I get people who come to me and they're like, oh, I want to build a community, but I'm not sure what, like a, who I'm building a community for. And mm -hmm. that's actually a question I'm not good at answering for people because I think that for me, it was so clear the type of community I wanted to build. And a lot of the people who I work with they they really care about the people who they're working with. So they're either like, they worked on a full-time job where they saw that these people needed this kind of help and they were in a really good place to help them. Or um, they were that person and they fully understand who that person is and how gathering those types of people are gonna help them. Or they're doing that work one-on-one -on -one or something like that. And like the community is just like the, the next step. I don't recommend just like uh, thinking of a topic to start a community around and then wanting to start that community from scratch. I think that's a lot harder because uh, it, it, it just takes a few more steps before you get to the steps that I'm describing. Um, because you also don't know if that's really what you're going to be interested in. Um, a lot of right. my clients, they, they know that they care about these people. They're, they're just like exploring a community as one way to serve them. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And one of the other things that you, you mentioned while you were speaking about this client was that something that she did correct was she didn't over promise what she could deliver. And that sounds like something that is a common mistake that people might be making. Like, is, is that so? Um, is there more to this? Yeah. Community builders tend to be very people pleasing. We tend, <laughs> I'm including myself in that. We tend to think like, especially when you're first starting the community and you're charging money for people to come and take your course or join your membership or whatever it is you feel like, how can I give away more and more and more? And that's going to make, that's going to make it worth it for people. How do I make it worth it for people? And it, there's like a few things. Number one, people are busy. And the more you try to overwhelm them with extra things, the less interested they might be in the thing that you're offering. What you need to do is design the community experience so that it aligns with the journey that your member is going on. And it's just the minimum. Like, what is it that like, if they do these, if they take these actions in community with these other people, they're going to achieve the goal that they're there to achieve. Anything beyond that is just noise and is just uh, going to be overwhelming for people. So it's actually 
we think that like, let me add all these other things so that people feel like this is like a, a good value. But what it does is it actually like muddies up what's actually important for that person to do in order to get to their goal. And it's actually a gift for you to pick the important things that they should do in community with other people in order to achieve their goal and leave out everything else. And yeah, it just, it makes the whole thing more clear. And Liz, for example, she could have added like a bunch of events that they were doing in, in the membership when they first joined. Um, she could have like had more in-person events or had more expert guests or things like that. But actually she knew who her members were and her members are busy. Like they're already thinking like, do I have time to show up for this like mastermind that happens once a month? Maybe, maybe not. Like it, it, this is going to be like an, an extra commitment for them to do. So it, we have to trust that when we put together a community experience, we're picking the things that are going to be most helpful for our members and leaving everything else out. Hmm. That, that sounds like a really important part of building a successful community business, because as you correctly said, it is one of, you know, it's a very common reservation that I feel like, I think even I have it when we started charging for the membership is how can we make the membership worth it? Because it's, it's often like, difficult to justify the price of community membership like you know you can have a course that that goes for like maybe 50 or 100 bucks and then you have a cohort based course and suddenly the the ticket price is 10x so it's challenging to make sure that the people who are buying it they're getting enough value out of it and they don't just churn out Yeah. I mean, I think that is a challenge and I, I think that we should take that very seriously. And, but that's why it's not a big deal to start with a smaller group because yeah, like maybe we're not sure um, if what we're doing is going to get them to the goal that they're going towards. But when you're in a smaller group and you can like handhold a little bit more and really do what we can to help the people who are there then you learn how to scale that like but first first you really do have to figure it out and you have to have confidence that what you're charging makes sense for for what you're delivering mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense okay switching gears a little bit if i already have an audience and i want to start monetizing it by building a community let's say i have twenty thousand people who are on my email list and now i want to start business from it and i want to start a private membership community in order to monetize this now one of the most common reservations is that it will just take too much of time and it will be really difficult to do that what what do you say to that like how much time should one realistically expect um, this to take and is it possible to maybe delegate this by hiring a community manager and just off like offloading that task to the community manager it could be yeah so if you if you already have an audience so the question around like how much time does it take or like how much work does it take to get this something like this off the ground um I mean, it, it depends on what you're doing and I think one of the things I've been thinking a lot about is similar to what we were just talking about you don't have to, like, you might have something in your mind about what a membership looks like or what a community looks like in general. And that might be like from a community that you were a part of and a certain business model that you saw someone do where it was very intensive. There was a community platform. There was a place where people are chatting. Like we all have that in our minds, but you don't have to do that to build community. So I believe that you don't even need a community platform if if you if that's not a part that you can see how to build into your process or how to build into your team. So maybe you're you have 20,000 people on an email list and you 
it's a newsletter that you're sending out weekly. And there's like a segment of that newsletter. There's like a certain type of person that, that like is interested in more or like wants to go deeper in the topic that you talk about. What if you just had live sessions that you did once a month with those people and you turn those into a membership where people could buy it and they could come to the live ones and that's all you did. Like all you're promising in the membership is you're going to get the same free newsletter and you're going to get invited to these monthly live things that we're doing. And you don't need a community platform for that. You can just send the link to the recording after if you're doing that. And that's a way to build community. Like, in, and it's like, it, it adheres to like, maybe people don't want to join. Like maybe your people don't want to join another community platform and like keep track with another group all the time. But they would be very willing to come on the second Tuesday of the month to learn from you, to connect with other people who are in your community. And that can turn into like your, your start of, of a community. And then you can grow from there. Like you can see like, okay, things are getting very messy. So maybe now we do need a community platform and now maybe we can charge a little bit more and you can build it from, from that instead of starting with, with like a a fully formed idea of what a a membership or what a community might be for you it's a way to Mm -hmm. test things that is a lot smaller yeah i like this idea a lot it makes me wonder like why aren't more creators creating like these tiny communities and monetizing their their audiences through these communities yeah one of the things that annoys me is all these platforms now, they have a way to charge your audience to get additional content from you. And that doesn't annoy me, the fact that they have that. So like Instagram has a subscription product. YouTube has a subscription product. It's like like it's like the Patreonification of, of the internet. Like everything, you have like a thousand followers and maybe like a few of them are going to want to pay you to get more premium content for huge creators that works really well because they have such a huge audience that even a very, very small percentage, if they, if they design the experience, right, uh, a small percentage of those people are going to want to go deeper into what they're doing. But people are so used to paying like $5 max for those types of things that it's just not enough of an investment for you to build an actual business around it, unless you're like have millions of followers and have a really clear idea of what, how this is going to grow. So I think it's important before you like turn on some kind of like monetization for your content, even on Substack or, or any of these platforms to really think about like, can I actually charge more for this? Or like, can I design something that's worth $40 a month or a little bit more than what these platforms kind of push you towards because it's really hard to make that model work unless you're famous. Mm. I I forget what your question was around this. It's just, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) it just reminded me of this thing that makes me mad. (laughs) No, my question was that why aren't more creators creating communities and monetizing their audiences? By building communities right. and um yeah and then you were spot on here it's like the platforms are uh, incentivizing them to just uh, create favored content and just creating premium content but instead it would be nice if they like it was possible in, within the platform to create like a little community experience and that would be that would make it easier for people to charge 10 times more and charging 10 times more is often easier than growing your audience by 10x. Yeah, exactly. The other thing that bothers me about that is that it it keeps the creator in the center of the circle. And mm. so it's, so someone is like signing up to get more of your face instead of like signing up to get a product that you've designed, that's going to get them to get value from each other, which is closer to what you want to get to if you're building a community. Mm -hmm. 
So a, a lot of creators are burning out from creating a lot of content and like having all of these people put all this like parasocial pressure on them. And I think a community, like building an actual product around connecting people to each other is actually a really good way where you can like little by little detangle yourself from your audience and just be like a filter for for people to come together around your ideas and around around what you talk about, but not necessarily you. So, yeah. Yeah, I like this. I think Lenny Richitsky, he, ha- he has done this really well with the newsletter and the community that he's built. Like, started with the newsletter and then to monetize it, he built a community that's, I think it's 30 bucks a month, which isn't a lot, but it's not like five bucks a month also. So now um, that community basically runs itself and it, it has like a few community managers, but it's a really big community and people are creating really awesome content over there. Yeah, like he, he writes a really smart newsletter. So people who read it, that means something about them. The fact that they read that newsletter. The thing that it means about them is not that they like Lenny. It means that mm-hmm. they're this kind of person who's thinking about these kinds of things. So the people who were coming to his community who want even more of the content that he's writing, those are people who are probably going to have things in common. And then our jobs as the community leaders is to like figure out what those things are that they have in common and help encourage people to connect around those things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not around us <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I love this um and i have one final question for you for this uh interview tatiana this has been a fantastic call so far and i wanted to pick your brain on growing the community a little bit so one of the things that you mentioned on your website is that you need to find a growth process that plays to your strengths and uniquely works for your offer what does this mean can you unpack this advice Okay. So that means like, are you, how do you like disseminate your ideas naturally? Are you a video person? Are you a writer? Are you really good at building relationships with people one-on-one? So what is like, where do you want to start? And then you pick one channel for a little bit and then you try and, and you see how it's working for you. So that could be on social media. Social media is kind of like the low hanging fruit. It's like the easiest way to find people who might be interested in what you're doing, but doesn't necessarily have to be social media. You could be doing a lot of like one-on-one outreach and referrals and building a network and having people connect you to those people. So those are the that's like the 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 strength question, like really simple, just like what is resonating most with you and is the platform that you picked working in your favor or does it feel like this thing that's not natural to you? Mm-hmm. It's, it's meant to feel a little bit uncomfortable, but not like completely opposite to who you are as a, as a person. What was the second part? depending on yeah it uniquely works for your offer like your community yeah so then your i talk about these four different types of community businesses so there's the one that we all think about when we think about community which is membership there there's a group coaching program which is like high ticket small group of people who you help along with whatever goal they're achieving And then there's two different types of course ones. There's the cohort-based course, which is like a short-term community experience where people are learning together. And then there is like an evergreen course plus event. So it's a pre-recorded course where community is part of the experience. So the first step is to figure out your member journey and which of those four is a better fit for what your members are trying to accomplish, like the journey that they're going on, which one makes the most sense for for them. And then the second step is to figure out which growth process is best at selling the offer that you figured out. So like if your type of community business is a cohort-based course, 
then your your growth efforts, like your your lead magnets, your like free events that you might host to get people on your platform, it should match the con- connection to learning ratio that your community business type will eventually have. So if it's a cohort based course, it's like 60, 40 learning to connection. So sorry, 40, 60 uh, connection to learning. So what you do to get people to learn more about you and to come into your audience should also match that ratio. Should It should be a little bit more learning than connection. So that might mean like hosting a workshop that has that ratio. So maybe in your workshop, you're teaching like one of the lessons in the course, but you also have time for people to connect with each other. So you're, you're balancing what you're doing for free to get people into your audience. You're, you're like considering what you're eventually going to sell so that it's like almost like a, a small piece of what they'll eventually get once they're in your community. What you don't want to do is if you're doing like a very like learning focused type of community you don't want to do a very connection focused way into the community because that doesn't actually give people enough information about what they'll ultimately get when they join your community and vice versa. Also, you don't want to do a super learning based thing. And then they join the community and it's all about networking. It's all about connecting with people. So the efforts that you do for your marketing should match that connection to learning ratio that they'll eventually get in your community. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. The connection to learning ratio, thinking through your community onboarding experience in terms of the connection to learning ratio that members are expecting from their marketing. I like this. <laughs> all right. Uh, this this is all the questions I have, Tariana. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing all of this insight with us. Um, please, where can guests learn more about you and how can who how, how can people get value from the business you're building? Yeah, so you can see, you can learn all about me and what we do at Business of Community at, on our website, businessofcommunity.co. Dot co, And we basically help community builders in three different ways, depending on what stage of the process that you're in. We have a beginner course for people who are just launching their community. We have a membership for people who already have a community business and are looking to grow it or professionalize it, kind of take it to, to the next level. That's BACB. That's our membership community. And then we also still do consulting. We do a lot of community strategy for larger creators that are pivoting into a community or adding a community to one of their offers. So we do that as well. And you can see everything on our website, businessofcommunity.co. We also have a free email on our website. We do, we have a ton of free content on our website um, that anyone can access there. That's amazing. Yeah, we'll link to all of these resources in the show notes. So check out the show notes and connect with Tatiana and learn more about business of community. Cool, (laughs) thank you.